the of the advanced project management program since the inception of the program in 2018. So this is the sixth year in a row that we've we've done this. Um, and yes, so this this gives us the privilege of not not um, only listening to one <laughs> one person the whole time, but to get some people from the industry to give us um, some of their practical experience from the industry to share with you. So um, therefore, we have people like you, Anita, joining us and other industry experts, which you'll meet this week. So thank you so much for joining us and making this a success once again. Thank you, Anita, for sharing your insights and experience and expertise with us once again. Um, we really appreciate your input and, and contribution to making this program a success. So yes. Thank you. I'll be hanging around here for a little while, so I'm looking forward to to hearing, to listening to your presentation. Thanks. Thank you, Adele. Great to be here, guys. Thank Thanks. And thank you very much. So, so everybody, I did I did uh, talk a little bit about Yonita. Um, that Yonita is what we call um, a, like a absolute top class project manager. Anybody that says Wagile. Uh, <laughs> who knows what they're talking about, right? Um, but there's a couple of other things we've learned. So there's two things for me about Yonita that is like really, really fantastic. Well, bar that, it's wonderful that she keeps on giving us some of her time. And she always has incredibly interesting um, presentations and things to share with us. But there's there's a couple of things we also learned from from Yonita because she really practices it and has been practicing it for many many years, right? I mean, you can see she's in a mid twenty, so at least for four or five years. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, thank you. I think you're my my most favourite person, right? <laughs> but 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 the thing is, what is what the, just just to give you an idea of the things that we've been we, you know, a lot of time. And that's where you need somebody that's got the wisdom and not the knowledge, right? Or the theory, uh, where people say, so, uh, you know, it's like, it's like agile, oh, so it's just like easy. It's like, no, it's actually not easy. It's actually incredibly, incredibly disciplined. And the other thing is if you do agile properly, um, it, Agile's whole focus is to get into the wallet, where a, a, a waterfall is the whole focus is to complete. It might actually even take you longer to do the agile, right? Um, but and that there's some things that agile is perfect for, and there's some things that waterfall is perfect for, right? Um, but the other really really nice thing is is Yonita over the years um, have been taking us also on a journey what is really happening out there, and that is nice because we've got a professional practitioner that is really 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 good, and that does this all of the time, um, that but. But that lives it. So you know, last year's and the year before um, is different. I mean, it's today as well. Navigating AI projects. It's a completely different thing again for us, right? I, uh, so, Yonita, I'm going to shut up so that you can go. Uh, do you want for them to wait till you finish for questions, or can they interrupt you as they go? What would I'm you happy prefer? either way. Whatever okay. works for you guys. Um, I've got a couple of questions in between as well. So you know, okay, if, wonderful. Uh, please, if if you have questions, uh, shout. But um, or you can post it on the chat, and we can go through some of okay. the questions. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Prof. Great to be here. Thanks, as always, it's, it's for me a, a great privilege. Um, I think you know by doing these kind of things, I also learn a lot, and it's so nice to engage with you guys and and get excited about this world that we've got um, in front of us. So, um, yeah, my name's Juanita. Like Prof said, I work for a company called Version One. We have got offices in Europe, UK, and we recently opened offices in America as well. I have got colleagues who are all across the world. So we've got teams in India. We've got a few people in South Africa, um, Europe, uh, UK, and also the States. So uh, it's quite a global company. We work with government, um, pr private sector, public sector organizations, and some of my clients are global. So you have we are exposed to so many interesting um, technology ideas and thinking from from different kind of industries. So it's it's a great privilege to be here, like I said, and thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, so just in terms of um, what we're going to talk about today, I'm not going to spend too much time. Oh, sorry, I won't get this. Um, very high level. I'm going to just give you a bit, bit, bit of an introduction on the topic, um, touch on what is AI projects, um, 
we're going to look at delivery frameworks and then just look briefly on what does this mean for us as project managers um, with the future of AI? That's yeah, so it's not even like a thing that can happen to us tomorrow or next year. It is right here, right now. So how are we going to navigate this? Um, I've got questions at the end, but please, like I said, pop a pop a note in the chat and I'm happy to answer or put up your hand. I just can't see if people put up their hand. So if um, you just want to interrupt, just give me a shout and say, hi, there's a hand up. Can I can I ask a question? Great. Um, yeah, so just as an introduction, um, you all know there's a lot of talk about AI, artificial intelligence and project management specifically. Um, if you just look on the screen, these are other articles that are found on Google or books that are out there, some studies that they're doing in terms of um, how um, AI can either take over our jobs or what are the best tools for us as project managers. So there is a lot of information and it is clear that we need to get a good grip on this technology to make the most of it. But although there's a lot of excitement, there's also a lot of caution. Um, I was involved in an AI project um, last year for one of our big global construction companies. And we were talking about, so what is next? Um, because now that they've done this proof of concept, um, they say, okay, what is our AI strategy? Because they've got a working model now and there's a lot of business divisions that are saying, oh, please, can you do a chat bot for us? Please, we need a virtual assistant for that. So they're stepping back and just saying, okay, let's look at it holistically and say, what is this AI strategy that we need to need to consider for the, for the organization? Um, they're getting a lot of resistance from their clients to say, you know, are you using AI in our projects? Um, and they are worried about the ethical considerations. What about data con constraints? Because working with AI in Europe versus America versus China, you know, there's so much, so many different uh, legislation around data specifically that, that they need to consider. So although they are uh, looking at it with a bit of caution, they do believe that there's enormous potential in embracing AI and using it to innovate their business, um, providing new products for their clients, but also to optimize um, efficiencies within the business and reducing risk, you know, the kind of risks that come in with human error and things like that. So the reality is not everybody is jumping on the AI bandwagon just yet. Um, uh, although there is a lot of interest, but some organizations have got this wait and see attitude. So they're trying to figure out what is the best move forward as they are concerned about sinking money into technology that might not last. Um, I don't know if you've seen it, but, you know, ChatGPT and then all these other new technologies came out. So companies are asking, do we invest in an Azure platform, build everything on um, Microsoft, and then six months down the line, there's a free tool that you, we can just buy off the sh or get off the shelf or tweak, and we've invested all this money going down the Azure rabbit hole. Or what about the AWS technology? So there's so many questions that companies are grappling with, and they are a bit concerned about what is the best way forward, because we don't all have a, a whole lot of cash just to sink into AI technology and not knowing whether that will work or not. Um, another big thing is getting data in order because not everybody's got all their data in the same place. I mean, we all know I mean, you've got things on your computer, then some is on SharePoint, others is on somebody's hard drive. So just understanding how do you put your data in the right order in the right place so that you can have a good AI model is also a big question for organizations. Um, so, but today, like I said, I'm just going to talk about what does a typical AI product look like? How um, does that impact what delivery framework, project management methodology you use? And then just quickly, what does AI look for project managers? So as with everything, and I think Prof, I've said it in the past when we were talking about agile projects, there's no one size fits all answer for every single company, every single project. Even within one organization, different approaches might be applied because it depends on what are your project goals? What is your company culture? How does your team work together? What is the technology that you're going to use? So, so many different things that you need to consider. Think about risks. 
stakeholder concerns and um, also the environment in which your organization operates. So lots of things to think about when you look at um, AI, AI projects. Um, just here, quick overview, a couple of books that um, also in terms of AI project management. If anybody's interested, I can highly recommend The Business Case for AI. Uh, this is probably one of my favorite books. Um, it explains AI from a non-tech perspective. Um, I work with a lot of tech people and I always have to say, guys, can you please explain this on my level or translate this into blonde because I don't understand all this tech speak. So if you are interested in learning about AI, I think definitely Business Case for AI is a really, really good, good book to, to get to grips with. Um, so any questions so far? Any Right. All right. So the field of AI is vast and often AI is used to reference different things. So some people think that robots are AI and others think that deep learning is AI. Just um, so a quick question from my side. Have any of you used AI in your work? And if so, what benefits or concerns have you encountered from AI? Um, hello, uh, this is Lemo here from <laughs> Liz Betty. Um, I I've used AI to kind of sometimes when I finished my my reports and I've looked at it so many times. I know mm -hmm. there's probably overexposures, things I'm not picking up. So usually mm -hmm. I'll just cut cut and paste and say to the to Chat GPT. Maybe I'll say something like a uh, proofread. You know, and then it will help me proofread my document and then I'll cut and paste it back onto my Word document and send it because then I know that I've had another set of eyes, so to speak, on it. All right, good. Excellent. And Lemo, do you think um, there are any, I mean, it's, uh, obviously the benefits are clear because it, it helps you, like you said, it's an extra set of eyes, helps you to, with your grammar. Um, I've always subscribed to Grammarly, which is sort of an older AI tool yes, to help yes. me write better. So, yes. you know, but with ChatGPT, those things uh, almost, you know, becomes obsolete, although I still still like ChatGPT. Are there any things that you're worried about in terms of using AI or do you think there's stuff that you think AI uh, you should be concerned in? I guess for me, my only concern would be obviously it it could possibly use better English than I have and maybe give a better impression that I would give face to face. <laughs> but I feel like maybe it, it's also the balance of um, um, the output, you know, if mm -hmm. I can still uh, give the output despite maybe my English not being so, so great, you know. Mm -hmm. And then obviously my other concerns would be um, some, if, if, any type of let's say for example my marketing team uh the especially maybe the digital specialist the one who takes care of the social media might be using um ai to generate some ideas the the, mm -hmm. the concern there would be are they are they too general um or are they not as not not i don't want to say authentic but um it might be that it's giving the same answers to everybody so no one is original anymore you know nothing is mm -hmm. Is, has that soul, the spark of the human. So that's my concern, mm. I think, from, from my yeah. department. You know, I think yeah. with marketing, it's a little bit more flexible than it would be in other, like, uh, departments mm. because, um, but I, I've noticed that how we ca can sometimes circumvent that is first feed it information or feed it your ideas. Then mm. it kind of learns then it, it kind of gives you more original, more tailored, more personalized uh, content. Yeah. yeah, because there's a risk that we will lose creativity because we'll depend on AI Correct. to get generic Correct. ideas. Correct, yeah. yes. Right. Thanks, Lemo. Vianco, I see you've got your, is it Vianco or is it Harold? Yes. Sorry. I, it's Vianco. <laughs> um, okay. So I've doubled in uh, quite a couple, a couple of times with ChatGBT. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, I, I agree with Lemo, that uh, you can use it, input your own ideas, and then have it extended and improve mm -hmm. grammar. But I think uh, one of the concerns is um, that I've noticed is the ability to, to use your critical thinking. Mm -hmm. So what it comes down to is it's easy to pop an idea and use mm -hmm. what has been said by um, AI instead of using your own ability to conjure up ideas and mm -hmm. concepts. Yeah. 
No, certainly it's definitely a risk. Uh, uh, Prof. Pete? Sorry, I'm going to just step over the, the apple cart. <laughs> <laughs> I've, been, I've been in technology from the days I was an electronic engineer, so and I'm a little bit older than the rest of you. Chat GPT has happened a million times in different formats. Mm. You know, every time we come up with some piece of technology that helps people, it's banned, it's bad, it's going to take over the world. We try and block it as much as possible. Guys, I remember when email came out, we were not permitted to send emails. Yeah. Because or print emails. Was, Everybody or print, wanted to oh print God. their emails. <laughs> remember, bro. <laughs> yes. And you know what? And every time a new technology comes out, it's going to replace project managers and it's going to replace engineers and developers. And all it does is it creates more jobs, right? Yeah. Chat GPT, totally. guys, what would you do if I tell you today you're not allowed to Google? You're going to laugh at me, right? <laughs> we went through exactly the same thing, mm -hmm. right? Uh, when Google started. The nice thing is we now know Google, most of the stuff you get is rubbish, right? Mm -hmm. Guys, my M students, and especially we've now decided at both universities that I'm involved in in New Zealand, right? They have to use ChatGPT because as part of what they're going to do, because remember, it's just technology, guys. It's just information. No information is always correct, right? No business book is always good. No journal is, you know, I can publish a journal. Who's our bright guy that was in the wheelchair that passed away a couple of years ago? Um, I'm walking. Stephen Hawking. Yeah. Hawk, Kevin Hawking, his first PhD was proving black holes. His second PhD was proving himself wrong. So what I'm saying, any of this research and any of this data, right? I will see if you use ChatGPT, okay? Why not use it? And guys, you know, so people go like, but ChatGPT, if I want to use ChatGPT 4.5, now I've got to pay a thousand rand a month. Or you just use Copilot, which is on Microsoft's mm -hmm. platform, ChatGPT 4.5 for free. So mm -hmm. I would rather let somebody use it to help them. I still need to know what you've done on your project, right? Wherever, mm -hmm. Whether you read an essential paper, whether you do an academic journal, whether you go and you check a little bit of, of ChatGPT to help you. You know, I said, we sat um, with that on the academic side the other day at WITS, and they were saying, yo, 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 but it can pass the exam. I said, you know, it can pass the MBA exam. I said, but then it must be really good, isn't it? I mean, if you say to me, it can pass an MBA exam, I guess there's good information there. But while we were online, they say, yeah, you know, but we'll catch them. I said, you won't catch me. I took, and talk about Grammarly, you Anita. I, mm -hmm. I went online, I said to them, okay, give me any question, right? So I took the question, I chat GPT. Well, I just co-piloted it, mm -hmm. right? Um, I took Grammarly. I said, please change that to informal speaking. Mm -hmm. It did. I said, please change it to academic speaking. It did. I put it into turn it in. It didn't pick up any plagiarism. Yeah. I said, guys, for me, the problem with from an academic point of view is not what tools you use. It's whether you use someone else to do your assignments. That's the danger mm -hmm. because that you will never catch. OK, so a lot of these things, I mean, guys, when I when IOT came out, sorry, you need to take too much of your time. The conversation. But, yeah, when IOT came out, everybody is like, oh, you know, this, there goes all the projects. There goes all the programmers. There goes all the business analysts. Right. Until one day somebody says IOT stands for things on the Internet. Mm -hmm. Right. And life went on. All it does is it creates more products, more services. Yeah. So. Please don't be over scared about these kind of things, right? AI will not replace um, technology. For We developed an app for a near, a bot, okay, because we call these things. Um, um, about you, when he was at Premier, right? And all the bot did is he did, we gave it the, um, we basically coded it. So, and funny enough, we, you still have to develop the bot. You still have to have a project to run the bot. OK, yes. and develop it. And all it and what it did is people don't like writing. OK, so we got this bot to do the project charters and all it does is just ask questions. Right. And then it does um, speech to text and it helps people draw up a project charter. So the only thing it did is it created better project charters, which created better project plans. So it actually enhances the work. You know, you get more projects people want because the, this difficult thing of having to write is gone. 
Sorry, you need to hold no. No, no. And I think the reality is it speeds up the process. So you can turn yeah. around that admin part much quicker. So you can spend time making sure you've got the right people in your project and also being a more leader instead of sitting doing reports and admin and writing project charters, because I think that's probably, no. you know. So I think I just want to add two 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 points. So my 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 daughters are in um high school. They also encourage to use chat GPT. Obviously, not to just do their homework, but they need to learn the technology. Um, I remember a few years ago, one of the schools still in South Africa said um, people were paying professional speech writers to help them write speeches for their kids. And as a mother, I said, I refuse to do that because I'm not teaching my kids anything. Then my daughter would not get the same high marks as the one who's had a speech writer writing their speeches. So it's the question of, are you giving people the tools to enhance their skills and are they using it to enhance their skills or are you giving them the tools just to make them lazy and think that they can outsource everything? So it's also how you apply it. Um, and I think one last thing is um, there's a lot of caution. I don't know in terms of the, 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 the policies and the legislation um, specifically in South Africa, but uh, the companies that I work with, the there's, there's a bit of a risk aversion for people to copy and paste things into ChatGPT because it is open and you are exposing your company data to risk. So I think that's something that I would caution about. Uh, companies are rather um, rolling out co-pilot for the organization. So it's locked down, it's just internal and the data cannot go outside of the organization. So I think that's just one of the things that people do need to caution against You know, by adding things to ChatGPT to check their work. So, I mean, for by all means, I think if it's things like research, or, um, assignments, but I think once it comes to company um, IP, that is something that I think it's important just to be careful. What do you put on ChatGPT? Because you can put it out there. And remember, ChatGPT learns every time you use it. So it's using your information to, to, to build its um, and models and algorithms. All right, excellent. Thank you, guys. That was really, really good. So let me just flip back to my presentation. Um, now I can't see it. <laughs> Sorry. All right. So um, just in terms of AI, so AI is a field within computer science that focus on creating systems that can mimic human thinking. So these systems use algorithms and computer models to analyze and understand data. There are lots of different types of AI, so it's not just robots, it's not just um, Gen AI or Chat GPT. You've got your machine learning, predictive analytics, um, robotics, adversarial fraud, learning and fraud detection, um, especially in banking sectors where it helps them to, to pick up on fraud. Uh, natural language processing, this is where um, I think, um, Prof. Pete, you mentioned where the chatbot, you can speak to the chatbot and it's understanding the human language and making interactions with technology. So it gives you that uh, almost like a virtual assist assistant. Computer, computer vision, this is where AI an analyzes, interprets visual information from the world. So very often used in self-driving cars, facial recognition technologies, that kind of thing. Recommendation engines, I mean, how many times do you think, oh, I quickly want to see how much is this thing on Amazon? And then you just get ads for all these things that relates to this thing that you were interested in. So recommendation engines, I think it's been used for years already in terms of um, understanding your behaviors and, and giving you person, personal recommendations for products. Um, and then generative models where AI create new content from realistic images to music by learning from existing data sets. So there are lots of potential in terms of AI to enhance our capabilities and transform how we work and live. So um, as we go through today, we'll see how we how some of these um, technologies are um, applied and how it can be used. We did speak about benefits and drawbacks. So I'll quickly go through this slide. Um, it eliminates inefficiencies instead of spending hours looking for information, drawing up documents. You know, you can actually do it much quicker with AI, reduce human errors. Um, we recently implemented a chatbot for a very specialized engineering function in one of our companies. Um, 
what they need to do is they need to go through legislation and all the different rules when designing um, buildings. And with this chatbot, we fit all this, um, the different legislation into the bot so the engineers can ask questions to get, get the information so that they can inform that into their designs. So if it's a junior engineer, often he misses some of the legislation because he doesn't know it very well. Obviously, guys who's been doing this for 20, 30 years knows where to go and find it. But if you have to go through piles and piles of legal documents, some of them was like a thousand pages per document to find the right guidance, it, it is a very slow process. We've done a calculation for them. So when an engineer would typically spend about four hours a day looking for the information to put into their reports, this with the chatbot it was reduced it to um, about a half an hour a day. So that cost saving, if you calculate it based on, let's say you just use the engineer's salary, a three and a half hour saving per day, 200 engineers across the company. Over a year, it was over 2.2 million pounds that they saved just by implementing that. So there's a lot of benefits in it if you use it right. And um, so we spoke about some of the drawbacks. I think the replacement of jobs is a real thing, but companies that I've seen are busy looking at how do we educate the people um, in terms of using the technology and how do we upskill them so that their work, although it might be replaced by automation, can be transferred into something different. So how do we upskill people so that there is a future for them? Um, bias and discrimination, there's been a lot of examples in the past where chatbots really went completely crazy in terms of bias and discrimination. Um, if some of the older recruitment AI technologies would um, scan CVs and just shortlist certain types of CVs based on and uh, on bias. So um, privacy concerns, security risks, ethical issues, there's so many, many other drawbacks. But I think understanding that helps you to navigate it and, and find ways to mitigate that risk. And I think one critical, critical aspect of any AI project is what they call the human in the loop. So you need to ensure that there's always a human in the loop or a decision making process that involves a person that guides, supervises, and refines the AI system to enhance accuracy, reliability, look at the ethical issues and complex decisions. So don't just outsource everything to technology because they certainly are going to have issues. So balance approach, maximize benefits, minimize risks, and maintain your human values at the core of technology. I think that is absolutely critical when you implement AI projects. Um, quick quote from Kavita Ganeshan. She's the author of the business case for AI, and she advocates to start AI initiatives without doing any AI. And I'll explain why now. Um, first, you need to understand the problem. If you don't understand the problem properly, or it's a new problem that you're trying to solve, it's not well defined. Putting an AI fix to it is not necessarily going to be your best solution. It might be a very expensive solution for very limited benefit. Um, data requirements, I, I touched on it earlier, it's so critical to have the right data, um, make sure it's in the right place. Um, it is probably one of the more complex parts of implementing AI projects is ensuring that your data is available and it's rightly structured for AI initiatives. And then obviously user skepticism. We, there's a lot of skepticism against AI, fearing the change, resistance, and then um, make, you know some of this can even hinder adoption. So having that change as part of your AI project is absolutely critical. And like I said, it's not just communicating the benefits, um, but also helping people to understand the technology and giving them the skills to grow with the technology. Um, so just quickly, a couple of key elements to be in place before implementing AI in initiatives. You need to have a clear vision and goals for integrating AI into the into organization. You can't just you know, say, oh, let's do this AI chatbot. And then, so it needs to be part of a bigger plan. 
Um, you need to evaluate high impact opportunities. Your use cases for AI need to be a good problem to solve with AI. You need to understand the problem well. Um, and then make sure your organizational is ready, the culture is right, adoption strategies in place. You've got some skills, advancement and uh, training also to help people to adopt it and to um, advance their own uh, skills. And then data, you need to have the right data. People, you need skills who can do this um, and develop the models. A lot of companies choose to outsource it because AI engineers specifically are quite a unique blend of skills that we don't necessarily always find in one one package. So you might need somebody with Python skills, a little bit of a um, front end skills, and also who understands AI model modeling. And so it's it's a really unique blend and. Um, a lot of specialists might not be able to, or currently does not cross all those boundaries. So it's it's getting people so skilled to manage those those kind of projects. And then metrics very important. How do you measure the success of your AI initiative? And it is not just the business value in terms of you know what is the benefit, how what is the savings, what is the risk reduction. It's also the, the technology measures in terms of how do people use it? What is my turnaround time? How quickly do we respond? How accurate is the response? So there's a lot of metrics that you need to consider around your AI projects. And then technology. There are so many technologies out there for AI. So how do you decide this is the best one? Do you do different technologies? Do you have the right platform in place? How do you integrate it into the rest of your systems? So lots of things to consider when implementing AI projects. All right. Um, before I go touch on project delivery frameworks, any questions just on AI projects, AI technology? Repeat. Prof, can you? I think you're still on mute. Uh, I am still on mute. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> just, just, sorry, just a quick one. You were saying two very important things for me in this in in this last piece, mm -hmm. right? The one is you start AI before AI, because you always want to look at a process that creates a product or a service. So, uh, AI is not the magic wand. And the mm -hmm. other thing, and I saw a, a paper from the the uh, vice president in Google that's heads up AI. And he said, if you think you're going to replace people with, no, if he says, he says, if you plan to replace people with AI, plan to fail. Yeah. And he said something funny. He said, what is this uh, fully automated call centers? Um, uh, so he said self-driving cars and something else. He says, mm -hmm. what have they got in common? He says, they don't work. So they're actually a bad example of AI. Because mm. no matter how good the AI is, somebody still has to code it, somebody still has to feed it, mm -hmm. and it's got no emotion. So it doesn't have a gut feel. Yeah. But thank you for that, Unita. I think that mm. is so important to just acknowledge that, you know, be because people think that's just a little bullet. It's not. Mm. No, but it's certainly. A, but it's a fantastic tool. Yeah, no, definitely. And, and I think that's the key is how do we use that to our advantage? Yeah. All right, great. Thank you. Thanks, Prof. OK, so on project delivery frameworks, um, quick question. Who can give me an example of a project delivery framework? Anybody wants to shout out some examples of project delivery frameworks? Prof, I think it's time for a spot test here. I would think so, you need to. <laughs> Come, guys, this one, we're not going to help you. Come. Maybe they're all asleep. Maybe this topic is so boring. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Oh, my head. OK, I think maybe I need to help them. <laughs> all right, guys. So sorry, let me just quickly flip over to my presentation again. Um, all right, so who has heard of any of these before? So project management framework provides structure and direction to a project. So however, unlike project management methodologies, neither too detailed nor too rigid. So it's a very 
overall process to guide your projects and while being flexible enough to adopt. Um, you've got Agile, you've got Lean, you've got Prince. I'm sure you've heard of some of those. All right, so just quickly, I'm not going to go into too much detail here. So project delivery framework covers how do you manage your products? So projects, it covers your phases in your life cycle. What are the processes that you need to follow? Certain tools and techniques, roles and responsibilities, templates, artifacts, governance, quality insurance, uh, community pro uh, communication protocols, risk management, and how do you continuously improve your project? So a lot of things that's covered. And like I said earlier, there's just different types, different names, but most of them have got similar things or in terms of the methodology of how you how you run projects. Um, so just in terms of AI projects, lots of reasons why there's a need for a different delivery approach. Um, although traditional frameworks provide a solid foundation, there are a couple of unique challenges and intricacies of AI projects that necessi necessitate a more adaptive and hybrid approach. And I think I just need to say that it doesn't just apply to AI. I think a lot of the projects that we are currently involved in are very complex. So most projects in my mind should have a bit of a, a different or a more hybrid approach. So um, just to touch on some of the reasons, AI projects are often very complex algorithms with lots of data and they need iterative model training. So the outcomes can be unpredictable, requiring more flexible and adaptive approach than traditional projects. Heavy data dependency, we spoke about that, ethical considerations, um, bias in algorithms, data privacy issues, and then potential misuse of AI applications also makes it makes it a little bit harder to manage. Um, traditional software projects might follow a more linear development process. AI projects often require continuous iteration, model tuning, and retraining. Um, there's a bigger involvement for the whole business in terms of implementing AI projects. Uh, one of the projects that I worked with um, quite recently, we worked with business users, we worked with the IT team, we worked with the data engineers, but we also worked with Microsoft because it's also in their interest to learn from people, from companies implementing these projects. So it's not just within the organization that we work in, but sometimes it's the wider network um, of, of collaboration um, that involves in this project. And then AI models need rigorous validation evaluation. So in, to, to ensure the performance as expected in real world scenarios. So often an agile approach, a reiterative uh, iterative is, is required to do this model validation. Uh, scalability and deployment. So deploying AI models, especially in production environments, can be challenging. You need to consider model versioning, real-time processing needs, integration with existing systems. So definitely quite a complex thing. Feedback loops, um, benefits of continuous feedback, where the model's predictions are compared with real-world outcomes. So getting that AI chatbot in the hands of the users and getting their feedback to say, if you look at this, answer that the chatbot is giving you, does it align with your experience? Or um, if you don't do that, a lot of people will not trust the model. Or on the other hand, if you don't have the experience and you just trust what the chatbot is telling you, you might be exposing your company to tremendous risk because you will put information in reports and things that is completely, you know, garbage in a way because you haven't tested that model um, uh, and ensuring that the feedback is is there. Regul regulatory and compliance issues. So there's a lot of different um, legislation that um, impacts on different industries, data in general, and often there's also global considerations. So for example, one of my clients have got offices in China. So how does the data impact the usage of the AI chatbot in China. So there's so many things that you do need to consider, especially around legislation and compliance. Um, then stakeholder education, change management. We briefly spoke about it. Critical to educate your stakeholders, your users, um, and then also manage that organizational change. 
field of AI is evolving rapidly, so all projects need to be designed to accommodate and leverage the latest advancements in AI research and technology. And like I said, you might be implementing this technology and then tomorrow there's a new thing on the shelf that is so much simpler to use or cheaper because with some of the big organizations, they charge you per usage. So, you know, it can easily add up. It might just be a few cents every time you ask ChatGPT a question, but it will add up if you've got a thousand users using ChatGPT for a few hours a, a day. So definitely lots of different considerations. Uh, just a quick quote from Sam Alton, Altman, CEO of OpenAI. So field of AI is going to be the best thing ever to happen to humanity or the worst, and we don't know which. And I think this is why it's critical for us to understand the technology, understand the aspects and see how you can manage this um, in implementing um, the different um, kind of things in your business. Um, this is a proposed project delivery framework. This is something I've developed while implementing AI chatbots for one of our um, organizations. I don't think it's the one size fits all model, but it combines a little bit of agile with some traditional waterfall you need to have certain steps in process. So I think starting off first is your AI use case funnel. This is you've got your strategy at the top and then you've got a whole lot of use cases that you need to consider. Do I understand this problem? Is this a good problem to solve with AI or is AI not the solution for this problem? So once you've got a good UA, um, AI use case, then you can take it through a process where you um, almost like a, a normal um, cycle of understanding the, the problem, define the project, um, and then go into a more agile iterative approach where you do development, training, validation, testing as a, as a continuous process. Um, deployment and integration, then monitoring and maintenance of your chatbot. So like I said, there's a couple of things that's a bit of a combination between waterfall and um, agile. Then critical all along the way is your stakeholder engagement, change management, and that you need to almost start before you even start with your AI projects so that you've got that adoption and that people upskill and make sure that they can embrace this technology. Um, another part of this review, iterate, evaluate, um, ongoing review, and I think there's a quantitative and a qualitative kind of evaluation. So understanding the usage of the chatbot, um, measuring the effectiveness, measuring the business value, creating those calculations to see what is the benefit to my business? How much risk have I reduced? Did I free up, for example, the engineering project that I uh, used earlier, the example is I've now freed up three and a half hours a day per engineer. How else can we, can they use that time to, to, to give us better benefit to the organization? Um, and then ongoing, continuous, progressive delivery of value, and then critical governance and ethics. Um, any, oh, sorry, now I have just skipped. Um, yeah, so just a quote from the Stanford Institute of Human Centered AI uh, director, Fei Fei Li. All projects are not just about building models, they're about understanding the problem, collecting the right data iterating on solutions and ultimately delivering value to stakeholders. Any questions on the delivery man module or de delivery model that I, that, that I quickly um, touched on? Thoughts, questions? I'll want to talk to you about that model, but <laughs> offline because that's okay. looks brilliant. Thank you, Pete. So, like I said, I don't think there's a one size fits all, but there is a need to do your traditional things that you have to do almost, but then there's the development cycle that you need to constantly test, iterate, and review. All right, if there are no so questions. May I ask the... a question? Yes, of course, yes, Emma. Um, on your model, um, the first uh, uh, item is uh, AI use case funnel. Um, mm -hmm. Is there a breakdown, like maybe a standard breakdown that we can use to make sure that the problem we're even trying to solve is even worth like going down 
I, I mean, using the rest of the the, the delivery framework, or mm -hmm. is it is it kind of like we'll see as we go? You know, the different things. So. Our organization, we've got um, a, a whole division called AI Labs, and these are really smart people who's looking at technology. We've got a couple of change consultants that have developed a model like an AI readiness model. Um, and this is something that we we offer to our clients. But they, in that book that I spoke about earlier, the business case for AI, they have a uh she she talks about an ai readiness not an ai readiness but a um, ai roi so the um return on investment of ai and she's got so, some sort of a checklist um i think just google it um i think you can download the checklist on that on our website as well um uh, so but it is uh, like i said it's it's quite uh, and she's got a lot of co cool articles around ai i think she's probably one of the gurus in terms of implementing AI projects, but she's definitely got a model to evaluate whether something is a good problem to solve with AI. Um, questions like, um, do we understand the problem? Do you have the right data? What is it that you want to achieve with this? And so so there's, there's um, definitely um, uh, some documents that you can download from, from that website as well. Um, and I'm happy to share it with uh, Marie and Prof. Pete um, afterwards if you guys want to just have a look. Otherwise, just Google the business case for AI. Um, I think it's Aviti uh, Ganeshan. Um, and then, you know, so, so like I said, on our website, you've got a couple of um, re free resources that you can download to have a look at it. All right. Thank you, ma'am. All right. Pleasure. Any any other questions? Okay. Um, sorry. And right now I have got a question. Um, so just before we look at um, future focus, how AI will change the way we work as um, project managers, I want to ask you, how do you think AI will change the role of project managers and the way you manage projects? Anybody wants to, to take a guess? Okay, does anybody think AI will change the way they work? Bianca? I, I, yeah, it does. Um, mm. Look, I, I don't have a lot of experience with scheduling and, and program mm. managing or anything like that, but I think um, it's definitely a tool that will be used to develop and improve the way that um, your project managers do approach projects in the future. Um, mm. Can maybe make it simpler in, in essence yeah you need to always say and i sorry i wanted to give the class some time to answer mm -hmm. first but i always say it's like our first ai really in project management was was software was mm -hmm. ms project and mind genius and those things mm -hmm. and that's changed the quality of the projects and we can do more projects it didn't you know again it was yeah. going to replace the project manager but it didn't mm -hmm. um, yeah. Definitely. Uh, Rafiwa, uh, you've got your hand up, but then Lemo, um, you're next. Rafiwa? Um, thanks. So, yeah, I, I just wanted to add to on the question you asked. I, I think uh, it also comes with quite a lot of confidence, um, mm. knowing that what you are dealing with, someone sitting somewhere will have dealt with the same way that you want to adopt. and. Um, if, if that's the way to go, um, it will also improve the time that we get to spend on dealing with this, a certain challenge. Um, thanks. Mm. All right, great. Thanks, Rafiwa. Lemo? Uh, I think Rafiwa beat me to it, but I was also <laughs> going to say <laughs> that, that, like you mentioned earlier, the time factor, we won't spend so much time trying to refine things like the project charter, then mm -hmm. some things will, will move along faster and then um, we'll then have more time to like uh, invest in the nitty gritty, the things that we know usually take too, too much time, especially the parts where we interact as, yeah. as humans, we tend to like have meetings when we're supposed to send emails. <laughs> yeah. So so that would help a lot. And, mm -hmm. I, and I'm guessing also it might, you know, once we, well, you know, it's like slang, it will, it, it might, uh, make 
certain parts of the project management fall away because they'll kind of be we'll kind of probably develop like a moss code or like uh, is like we get to it faster so that it, it becomes it either comes we quickly do it or it falls away because we already know that mm -hmm. um it will be covered through ai something like that we'll kind of develop mm -hmm. a slang around what's the I, I, there's this term that i'm trying to find but like it becomes it kind of converges and merges with certain things so that it's no longer the thing it's just yeah. quickly into the core hmm. no definitely and i mean uh, uh so one example uh, co-pilot the you the licenses are extremely expensive um but you can it helps uh, um developers code but it's also got this functionality that it sits on teams so it records it uses the your transcript from your meeting and as soon as the meeting is done it generates the meeting notes and sends it to everybody who attended the call now i would love that because it feels like half my life i spend making notes and typing it out and sending you know a summary of what was discussed what was the decision so something like that will save me hours a day um but once again, you've got the risk that not everybody wants meetings to be recorded, um, but still, if it can just help you with half of the notes that you have to take, it's certainly a, a big time saving. Um, I know we only have and also the language it. factor. Yeah. Um, I know yes. a lot of our meetings yet, let's say, because we're a Sisutu radio station, we do use vernacular and MS mm -hmm. Teams does, is, does, isn't always able to pick up on that. So for us, yeah. it's it might not be a benefit, but I don't think that technology is so far away that it can pick that up because there's so many of those language processing models out there. Um, so it's a matter of just training the model in, in a new language. Um, but I do know that we have got only seven minutes left. Uh, so just quickly, um, last couple of things. Um, Yonita? This is, Yonita? Yes, Bob, sorry. It's it's. The only time limit is, is for you, hey. Okay. Perfect. So you can, yeah. <laughs> All right. No, that's fine. But I do, I do know that you know, sit, sitting listening to a presentation for an hour can be exhausting sometimes as well, especially because it's so so much information. But thank you. Um, let's um, the, let me continue, and then let's see how far we get. Um, so. This is from a Gardner report that um, I, I recently read, uh, July 2023, so it's about a year old, but still I think this is quite critical. They talk specifically about the project management office, but obviously it, it applies to project management. Um, and the summary of the article or, or the report is that project managers need to shift from traditional directive approaches to more dynamic and adaptive models. This change is essential to meet the increasing demands of rapidly changing business environments and to cope with dis disruption. So you can't just be checking boxes and sitting in your director law uh, corner and say, you know, if you can't do this step. So it, there's a, definitely a need to be more dynamic and adaptive. Um, one of the predictions from this report is that by 2027, 60% of IT and di digital initiatives will reach the approval stage without human intervention due to AI integration. So the first part of your decision process of which IT um, initiative you're going to pursue will not even uh, require any people to uh, um, involved. So that is quite, quite critical. You can imagine how that will impact project managers as well. Um, recommendations from this report is there's a need for project managers to adopt new technologies, foster a culture of strategic collaboration across businesses and technology um, teams. So we need to make sure that we grow our own capabilities and skills so that we can cope with these new kind of projects. Um, and I, when I was reading this, I was thinking about probably about 10, 15 years ago, there was a big drive from the HR community to say, oh no, HR needs to say seat at the table. HR needs to become a strategic partner. And I think it's moved quite far along because I can see a lot of companies are worried about skills and how do we manage talent. Now I think the call is also project managers or the project management office needs to have that business strategy hat on, drive value for the business. So it's our time to have a seat at the table next to the CEO and see how we can drive that kind of conversation on a strategic level. 
Um, just a couple of um, ways in which um, AI can transform the lands landscape of project management. Uh, one of the things I wanted to mention earlier, if you guys go on the PMI website, they've got a free training course for AI and project management, just how project managers can use AI tools to make their jobs easier. So um, obviously, uh, you know, you guys are studying this. It's maybe an hour um, training course and gives you like a free certificate from the PMI. So it's it's quite a good thing to just go and, and check out just to get an idea of what how AI can impact you as project managers. So automation of routine tasks. Um, so it's very good at AI is very good at automating repetitive tasks such as scheduling, email reminders, report creation. So automation frees up project team members to focus on more strategic and creative aspects of projects. Um, predictive analytics. So you can use machine learning, big data to provide predictive insights that can help you anticipate and mitigate risks. Um, this will enable proactive management to significantly enhance the accuracy of project forecasting and trend identification. Um, optimize resource management. So what we usually have is when we've got a new project, I've got a big database of CVs, um, but then I've got another system where I need to see who's available and who is not currently allocated to a project. And between those two systems, I need to figure out who are the people who's available and has got the right skills to work on my project. So imagine if you can just feed this into an AI machine and they say to you, oh, these guys are available, they've got the right skills and they will be perfect for your project. So lots of things around resource um, management that you can optimize. Um, real-time project mon monitoring. AI tools can offer your real-time monitoring and reporting, provide you with timely updates that can help you make necessary adjustments. So there's so many different tools out there. Cost reduction, just think about your time. If you don't have to type out minutes every day, um, you know, just that will really reduce the cost of your project or giving you the right resources at the right time so you don't have to pay uh, to have people on your project when they're not required yet, for example. So lots of different different ways to reduce costs. And it can improve decision making. So because AI can process large volumes of data, it can provide you with better um, insights and help you to make better decisions. So um, because sometimes you have to make a decision on the fly and you don't often have all the information at hand or you can't speak to every single person in your team to get the get get that. So imagine if that information is already available and you can just feed that to, to help you with um, with um, with uh, good good decision making. Um, like I said earlier, AI, although there's a lot of opportunities, it will not replace the need for human oversight. Successful integration of AI projects um, requires a, definitely a balanced approach, both technology and you need the skills, but you still need that human in the loop that we spoke about earlier. So I, I don't think we should worry as um, project managers that AI will take our jobs, but I do think that we need to embrace this technology and see what is the best way for us to use it? How do we upskill ourselves to ensure we can, we can be even better project managers but also coming back to the, that Gardner report, have that strategic seat at the table. Look at the big picture, see how projects can add business value. Um, lastly, um, I just want to end with a quote from the CEO of Microsoft. So um, the quote is, the most exciting thing about AI is not just the technology itself, but what it enables you to do by way of amplifying human ingenuity. So I think this is just a reminder that the true value of AI does not lie in the technology, but in its capacity to enhance and extend our human capabilities. For us as project managers, this means that AI is not just a tool for efficiency, it's a partner that we can use to be more creative, help us to solve problems, manage projects more efficiently, and also to allow us more time to focus on leading teams. So let us embrace AI, not just a technolo technological advancement, but as a catalyst that empowers us to achieve more, pushing the boundaries of innovation. And I think I need to probably stop talking now. Any questions? Hi, good morning, Joanita. Hello, Nick Fusana. 
Uh, it's not a question really, just a statement. I, I, I do believe that uh, AI and, you know, automation will uh, somehow, you know, uh, uh, cripple us uh, in, in South Africa. It will definitely take uh, our jobs away, not entirely, you know, but a, a few percentage. Uh, just for uh, example, let's take filling stations. You know, I was just the other day I was talking to uh, my colleague uh, in the Netherlands, you know, with filling stations, they do not have the uh, the petrol attendants. Mm -hmm. And then you imagine if in South Africa we do not have uh, petrol attendants to do that for us. So and 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 most of the people doing that job, you know, they they have your standard sevens, your grade eight, grade nine. Mm -hmm. uh, where mm -hmm. where do they go? Where will they go? You know, in mm -hmm. South Africa. So uh, it will take our jobs away, not entirely, but it will. <laughs> so, Nkosana, I agree with you. Sorry. So I live in Spain and I have to go and fill up my car. And for the first couple of times, it was strange coming from South Africa, having to fill up my car. And, you know, I would park too far away from the bed, from the machine and then I had to get in, move my car. So, but the opportunity is there. And, and I think it's a bigger problem to solve um, you know, especially with the South African um, economy and environment is how do we upskill a nation and give them skills to do other jobs? Because in all fairness, do you, it would be good for us to get it to a place where we can say, you know what, we can give people skills to do something else. Because not everybody wants to be a petrol attendant for the rest of his life. Maybe he wants to become a mechanic. Maybe uh -huh. he wants to do other things. Um, but I think, you know, obviously, you know, it's, it, it can get into quite a, quite a difficult discussion. Um, the reality is it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, 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 a almost a economical question or a political yes. question in terms of how do we grow a nation and to upskill people? And, and there is a risk, um, but, you know, it's, it's probably not something that we can solve here. Um, yeah. I've got uh, Lemo. Can I, can I just yeah. add one thing to that? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, you need to, and 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 Kusana, this you got to understand the different plat, the different environments as well. It's like um, New Zealand is like like the UK, like uh, Spain, um, but the minimum wage there is between thirty five and forty thousand rand a month. The minimum wage in South Africa is like four thousand rand. Mm. So again, you know those things are. To be taken into consideration. Another very, very big thing for me is we must look at the opportunities. I mean, we we've got an official 42% unemployment, but most probably an unofficial, more like 52% unemployment, right? What opportunities can we do? I mean, one of the things we would, I mean, you need to say she's got a couple of people in South Africa, right? Um, it's like what we can create these environments. We can we can work for you, Anita. Who, in, in Spain, which works for a company in Ireland that services companies all over the world, right? Mm -hmm. We also have that opportunity because it's not expensive to live in South Africa. So, mm -hmm. I mean, we're busy building and, and uh, where we're saying is, oh, we will use good South African people because they mm -hmm. they are serious with what they're doing and, they, and they're flexible. So, um, yes, as much as there could be negatives, there could be huge, huge, huge positives mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Can I just add one last comment? So, uh, and then Lemuel and Vianco, um, what we see specifically in Europe, there's a huge skill shortage. People are can't retire anymore because there are no people to fill those jobs. Um, and by implementing some of these things, taking taking um, you know, you fill up your own car. Yesterday we um, we were flying back from Lisbon and the airport was chaos because all of a sudden there are no people at the checking counters. You need to check yourself in and go and weigh your own luggage. Half of the people didn't know how to do it. So it was just just chaos. But because there's such a skill shortage, it's far better for companies to automate that process. I go and check in my own luggage at the airport because now they can use those people in other jobs. And I think that is the thing that we need to get um you know, globally, and then I think for South Africa specifically, there is going to be such a need for us to be able to work globally and have those skills because Europe is an aging continent. People are dying and there's nobody 
there to replace their jobs or there's not enough skills. We have got in our company a recruitment drive all the time. They, we're constantly looking for people with skills because there's such a skill shortage. So I think although it is a risk for South Africa, but it's also an opportunity to grow South Africa, to 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 upskill people. And I think there's a lot of investment requirement required to do that um, and also willingness for people to be able to better themselves. And, you know, I love South Africa. I I've, I've grew up in South Africa. I think I've never met people as amazing and as hardworking as South Africans. So I, and I do believe that we've always picked ourselves up. And I, I have seen often where people would prefer to employ South Africans because we work hard, we, we're smart, we know how to do things. So it's definitely, I think, the willingness is there, the people are there to do it. It's just how do we get this um, and to, to, to lift up, lift up this, um, the, the, the nation in, in that manner. Um, sorry, I'm completely going off topic here. Lemo, you've got, been very patient. Um, thank you. Um, I think I, I, I've i seen this trend on social media, so I want to disagree about the pe petrol attendance because um, in 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 socially the petrol attendance are seen as a luxury i i know that i've seen on social media people uh shaming the other european and western countries that you guys will say you are developed countries but you don't even have petrol attendance so <laughs> so i think it's always about how 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 mm. the society sees it yeah uh, but uh, but we that also just... don't have people in the shops to pack our groceries we have to pack <laughs> yeah. our groceries you know so it's Yes, ma'am. That was purely anecdotal. But my my mm. my point that I wanted to say was I think with AI, the same petrol attendant now has a powerful tool on his phone to upskill himself or herself. They don't have to now wait to, for access to a university. And if they're enterprising enough, they can learn to code or they don't even have to learn to code now. They can use the code on 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 the AI platforms to create uh, online Thanks. businesses, et cetera. So I think it it would the the more important thing would be how to get that type of thinking into those people's mm -hmm. minds. Listen, here's an opportunity. This is how you can use it. Maybe an NGO or I don't know, a person mm -hmm. of goodwill or companies of goodwill can partner with someone to get the information and the type of thinking and the mindset so that because if we wait for the government, if we wait for political will, we may wait <laughs> for yeah, until the cows come home. No, yeah. So true. I think it would be about a person of goodwill. Um, mm -hmm finding the money the csi the the, the mm. right company who would want to partner in taking this to the the townships and taking yeah. it to the people who need that mind that paradigm shift mm. and and i need and i have to agree with you the best developers or coding engineers i've ever worked with has never had a day at university some of them hasn't finished matric but they've learned on YouTube, they've just been playing around with code. And in a way, I think they're far better coders or engineers than some of the guys who've been to universities and just, you know, learned from textbooks. So definitely, you don't need to have a university degree to to be able to do certain things anymore. And uh, so Bianca, one, uh, I'll be with you now. Another thing is, I think with technology and things changing so quickly, University degrees might also change because by the time you finish your three year degree, a lot of that information is old and outdated. So we need to find ways to learn faster because going through a three or five year program might not be as beneficial as what it was 20 years ago. Bianco? Hi, sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to ask you something about AI within. Uh, the construction industry, how it can be applied, uh, other uses for it, and also um, in the R&D departments. Is, is that something that you see often being used, implemented? Uh, is there space for it? Um, yeah, I think so. So the couple of uh, use cases, I think the one that I explained earlier about how engineers are using the, the legislation and certain guidance and rules in order to getting the getting the data 
to help them, um, you know, with designs and with their reports. That that is one use case. Another one that I've seen uh, a lot of these construction um, companies they do uh, a lot of bits. They spend a lot of time doing bits, um, and they through your bid or your proposal process, there are a couple of opportunities. So. The one um, organization developed a scraping tool. So they go onto all these websites where they um, publish the bits or the, and then they get that and say, um, and, and then part of this AI technology evaluates that and say, is this something that we want to, to bid on? Do we want to submit a proposal? So it's getting the, getting the opportunities, evaluating the opportunities. And then there's another one where they say, okay, we've got a lot of, content that we've already created, um, previous proposals. So you've got this whole database of proposals. Now I'm looking at this bit, all this requirement. Um, how do I um, how do I respond to this? So then you generate content that's already used in previous proposals to put a structure together for your bid. Um, and then that that also helps. And like I said, the matching of CVs to the projects. So that's a couple of things. Um, I know one of our clients, they developed a chatbot to sit on top of their project software, specifically construction company, to give them the data and to ask questions because they've got vast amount of project documentation for the specific project, but then it allows people on the project team to go and ask questions to say, you know, as a chatbot to for feedback on that. Um, so, I, you know, other, I can't really think of any other examples right now, but I'm happy to to go and look for, we've, we've done a specific project for um, a, a museum to allow people with disabilities to observe it. So you've got AI, so if you get to a specific exhibition, then it will explain it for you and give you a picture of what does this um, does does this exhibition look like, um, so that even people with disabilities can enjoy the um, you know the the experience of the museum. So yeah, lots of different things. I think it's just you know defining the problem and then understanding how is it that AI can solve that problem. So maybe go with what is the thing that bothers you most about this job, and then see. If I implement AI, will it fix the problem? Um, and and what are the what are the benefits that I will get out of it? Um, like I said, you know, it's expensive to implement AI. You might just um, you know do the calculation and see if if AI will the benefit of implementing AI will reduce the problem so much that it will make sense for you to invest. Right. Thank you, everybody. This was lovely, and I you enjoyed it. Wow. <laughs> Every time I think it can't get better, you appear and there it is. <laughs> Thank you. <Paul. laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, this is the best AI project management um, presentation I've ever seen. I, I, I really, really, this is brilliant, brilliant, brilliant stuff, Yunita. And thank you very much. And thank you for your time. Um, but thank you for sharing with us. It is amazing as always. No, it's a pleasure. And I really love speaking to you guys. And it's such a great opportunity. So thank you very much. Thanks, Yunita. Thank you, Marie. All right, guys. All the best with your the rest of your course, and yeah, enjoy it. Now, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know how I'm going to do it after this, but anyway, we'll. <laughs> 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 no, Prof. Pete, you're brilliant. So. Um, <laughs>